It's great to be here. I want to um, talk about history to start out and uh, to ask a question, why is the 20th century often called the American century? Uh, the answer I would provide is uh, very much summarized in this graph here. It's showing the average level of schooling completed by adults in the United States, uh, national data, going back more than 100 years. Uh, starting in 1890, the average adult had about uh, seven and a half years of schooling. That amount of schooling increased relentlessly uh, for the next 80 years, all the way through 1970 or so. The United States, uh, in the 19th century, with Germany was first to provide uh, universal primary schooling. Uh, later, alone, really, was uh, first to provide university, universal secondary schooling. Uh, in the 20th century, it built up a uh, system of universities that's second to none in the world. Um, that provided the human capital that uh, made for such a productive workforce uh, that the economic growth that resulted from that uh, made America a world leader. And uh, it, uh, and uh, it first and foremost, I think, is why the 20th century is, is the American century. But look what happened around 1970. This uh, remarkable upward trend in completed schooling uh, flattened out. Uh, and only in the last 10 or 15 years or so has it started to creep up more slowly uh, at a very uh, slow rate, much slower than before. If you look at the consequences of that, what you see is very troubling. The United States has fallen from first to 19th among developed countries uh, in terms of high school graduation rates, first to 19th. Uh, it's fallen from first to 12th in terms of college graduation rates. Uh, this leadership position that we had for over a century has been compromised. Uh, most striking, I, there was an OECD report about this, the United States is the only country where soon to retire workers have completed more education than new workers. It, it's an incredibly sobering statistic. So what went wrong and what can we do about it? That's really what I want to uh, talk about. And it's a very important question, not only for how productive the workforce is in the United States uh, 25 years from now, whether the U.S. is able to maintain its economic leadership, but it's also very important for the American dream, for families believing that their children will grow up to do better than they did, uh, to complete more education than they did, to have better jobs than they did. It's really a, uh, a value that generations of Americans have held near and dear. Uh, here's some information about how that's been going uh, recently. It's, um, it's tracking, uh, starting in 1930, uh, people uh, around the time that they turned 25, so this is uh, as they were entering adulthood, and it's simply comparing, again, these are national data, uh, the education level, in this case, of men relative to their fathers. Uh, it's a similar pattern for women relative to their mothers. But uh, around 1930, about 40% of men had completed more education than their uh, fathers had by the time they were age 25. That increased very steadily up through um, about 1960, 1970 or so. Right? This kind of upward progress in terms of intergenerational mobility. But since then, that's turned down. So we've got uh, smaller fractions of uh, men who are completing more education than their fathers. If you have a parallel kind of figure for what fraction of men are completing less education than their fathers, that's gone up. Similar patterns for uh, women relative to their mothers. So this kind of idea that we're always moving ahead, we're always producing the next generation uh, that's achieving more than the past generation, that's, that's, uh, that's at risk now. And it's really an alarm bell that, uh, that needs to be sounded. Why? What, uh, what's caused uh, this slowdown in completed schooling? And the story that I want to tell uh, relates to a major component of this, 
uh, and that is the widening attainment gaps and achievement gaps between high and low income kids. Uh, it wasn't always this way, but it's been this way in the United States for the last 30 or 40 years. And I want to tell that story and I want to talk about what we can do about it. Uh, the story is told in excruciatingly de detail in 25 chapters in, uh, in this book, uh, with our opportunity. So there are, there are two books that you should be thinking about. Uh, this is the academic book, uh, 25 chapters written by different uh, authors, and uh, Dick Murnane and I were the co-editors of this book. Uh, Dick and I are now in the process of producing a 150-page uh, summary volume, half of which will tell the story of uh, of the book, and half of which will talk about policy solutions. Uh, policy solutions for pre-K, policy solutions for elementary school, for high schools, uh, policy solutions for uh, income support programs. Um, we asked an editor, how can we make a book that's going to sell a few copies? And she said, don't put any graphs or figures in it. <laughs> so we have almost no graphs. It was very painful for, uh, for me to do this. But uh, we have a lot of stories about what classrooms look like. We have a lot of stories about what families look like. Uh, and we're really trying to tell this story of what happened and what, what we can do about it. So the basic problem, and uh, it's really developed, as I say, over the last 30 or 40 years, is that the uh, amount of schooling uh, that high and low income kids are attaining uh, have grown at very different rates. So the gap in attainment has uh, increased a lot. Uh, this is information from two big national surveys. Um, it, the first point shows uh, kids who were uh, teenagers in the mid-1970s. Uh, the second point shows kids who were teenagers in the mid-1990s. Right? So these kids are, are tracked starting at age 14. You ask how much uh, family income is. You can sort them into high and low income groups. High income here isn't the top 1%, it's uh, the top 20%. Uh, families with incomes above $120,000 or so. There are 18 million kids in families in the top fifth of the income distribution. And uh, we compare, in this case, the families in the top fifth to the bottom fifth. The bottom fifth uh, consists of children whose family incomes are below about $28,000. Uh, and if you look first at the low-income kids uh, back when uh, for the teenagers uh, in the mid-1970s, uh, only about 5% of those kids uh, went on to complete college. Right? So we're measuring income at age 14, we're kind of rolling the camera ahead 10 years, and we're seeing how many of those kids actually attended and completed a four-year uh, university education. 5%, it's a very low figure. Uh, you'd expect it to be higher for high-income kids, and indeed it is, 36%. But the big story, there was some progress for low-income kids. There are uh, more of them graduating from college now than used to be the case. But it's only a little bit more. It's only four percentage points more. Up at the top, the kids' uh, graduation rates, college graduation rates, have gone up a lot. So if you think about that, that general trend in terms of average education, um, high-income kids are, are keeping pace. They're, uh, they're uh, attaining more and more schooling. College graduation rates are increasing. Uh, what's happening is that the gap between the high and low income kids and the middle income kids, they're kind of in the middle, they're falling behind the higher income kids. These gaps have increased, and they've increased quite substantially. So these are college graduation rates. Maybe what's going on is uh, college tuition has gone up so much. Uh, we know that that's been the case over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, we know recently with the recession, with state governments hurting so much, uh, certainly in California, also in Louisiana, uh, the cutbacks in the university systems, the state university systems have been uh, horrendous. Uh, and as a result, tuition has gone up a lot. So maybe it's tuition. Well, that isn't all of it, and it may not even be most of it. If you say to yourself, well, that just like, looks like a bunch of tangled lines, that's the point. These lines are showing uh, relative income differences uh, at the bottom and top end of the income distribution. So bear with me for a minute here. This is uh, just after World War II and running all the way through 1979. 
it turned out to be very much a golden era for uh, the U.S. economy, both in terms of the amount of growth and in terms of the equality with which the benefits of growth were shared across the income distribution. So if you look, for example, at the bottom 20% line, that's the solid line here. Um, back in 1947, uh, the family that had an income right at the point where 20% of the families had less, 80% had more, that was an income of about uh, $14,000 in, in today's dollars. All right? If you kind of track that dividing line between the bottom 20% and the top 80%, um, that 14,000 doubled to about $28,000. All right, so low-income families uh, were benefiting from this economic growth, which pretty much doubled uh, GDP, uh, with incomes that also doubled. Uh, if you do a similar kind of calculation at the top 20%, that's the dashed line here, um, the income distinguishing the bottom 80% from the top 20%, uh, was about uh, uh, about forty five thousand uh, dollars back in nineteen forty seven that doubled to eighty ninety thousand dollars or so so families have shared uh, equally in the sense that their income doubled as well uh, once you get to the rarefied atmosphere of the top five percent uh, you're talking about an income back in nineteen forty seven of about uh, $70,000 or so, that separated the top 5% from the bottom 95%. Uh, and that 75% doubled to 150000 So everyone was, uh, was doubling their income. Uh, this is a classic case of a, a rising tide lifting all boats. It's the kind of economic growth that you want to see. Now look at uh, what's happened in the last 30 years. It's a dramatically different story. So now we're centering 1979 right here. We're readjusting, and people are um, back at. Jim, Sorry. Wait a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, we're setting that back equal to one, and now we're seeing what's happening in the same kind of way between 1979 and about 2009. Uh, in these graphs, the shaded areas are recessions. So you can see, you know, during recessions, uh, everyone takes a hit to some extent. Uh, in, in the early 80s, there, was a, there were two small recessions, one very sharp recession during the Reagan years. Um, that's when the bottom fell out, really, of the bottom of the income distribution. And they never recovered. Things were better during the 1990s uh, under Clinton when uh, growth rates were very high. But that was lost in the recession in the early 2000s. And it's really been lost in the most recent recession. Right? So in contrast, it's a different scale up here. Nobody's doubling their income except the top 1%. But uh, for the low-income families, remember their incomes were about $28,000 in uh, 1979. Their incomes are still about $28,000. They haven't gone anywhere over this period. Uh, in contrast, the uh, top 20%, uh, their incomes were uh, about $75,000, dollars $80,000. Uh, they've gone up. They haven't doubled but they've gone up about 30%. Uh, top 5%, it's about 42% or so. And then once you get to the top 1%, that's where you're really seeing the, the, the action. Uh, income's more than doubled at the top 1%. But I want to make clear here, I'm not talking about the top 1%. Right? There's a whole set of issues related to the top 1%. I'm talking about the 18 million kids who are living in families in the bottom 20%. 18 million kids that are in the families in the top 20%. And their economic fortunes have diverged very substantially over the last uh, 30 years, uh, very much in contrast to the way things were after World War II. So what are the consequences of this income inequality? And where did it come from? Let's ask that question first. So why is it that uh, there's such uh, a, a difference in terms of how economic growth is benefiting different uh, people in the income distribution. Uh, 